going to start off where we left off last time. I posted the fix to the issue that we were running into relating the role of the coin. And I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about that. Um, I did not anticipate this problem, which was probably obvious. It is cleverly edited out of the video from the last uh, time. Um, but the problem basically was I set some instance variables in my code behind, and each time they got called, they recreated the variable. So therefore, I couldn't keep track of how many times the person rolled the dice. So each time it said it was initialized back to zero, and so it never disabled the die um, for them. So I could, I could roll it indefinitely. Um, the solution to it isn't that hard, but if it's confusing, don't worry about it because we're going to come back to the concept later on, but just sort of in the spirit of being complete, I wanted to show you how I solved this particular problem. There's actually a couple ways to uh, solve this problem, and there are some issues with the way I solved it, and we'll talk about that in a second. that said I made an announcement. I think I'm grouchy today. <laughs> Maybe not. I don't know. I think I'm just sleepy. Second day of the week, yeah. Good thing is, is, is like like yesterday, like I have a nine o'clock class and then I have a one to three class. And it's like, almost like before I was completely awake, like a quarter of my week was done. So, that's, that's awesome, you know. Uh, and now, we're, we're, you know, after today, we'll be half done with the, with the work of the week. All right. So, I'm going to go and open this guy, and we'll see the changes that I made. The idea, again, is any variables I declare those variables are going to get recreated every time I, I call that page, even if I'm posting back. A post back is when a page submits to itself. So even when I post back to itself, any variables I create get recreated. Therefore, I couldn't keep track of the number of roles that way because every time it would reset to zero. Even if I put code in the uh, file uh, or uh, page open event, um, that wouldn't work because it's not a case of the variable being there. It's a case it's a brand new variable each time. So if I don't initialize it there, if I check to see if it's a postback and don't initialize it there, um, in the case of a postback, it's a brand new variable. It's going to be blank anyhow. So I have to find a way to accommodate setting the variable the first time I load and then resetting it um, based on what the value used to be um, every subsequent time. So let me, let me show you what I got here, and then we will review the code. So I'll make that my start page. Web 
forms have a property called post back, or actually is post back, which is a Boolean, which is either true or false. And a post back is when you've submitted the form back to itself. So the first time a form loads, it's not a post back. Each time I press the button, it is a post back. All right. So um, the idea is, is I want to initialize a variable if it's not a post back. If it is a post back, I, I want to remember the old values. So now, this is the initial load of the page. This is not a post back. Therefore, I want to be initializing the variables. I roll. It rolls the dice. Eventually. Oh, I think I left my break point in here. I didn't. I have some editing do, to do today, too. All right. That's weird. At any rate, uh, maybe not. So, I go in, I pick this guy. I'll, I'll say, for the sake of argument, I'm going to roll... I'm not 100% sure um, why that caused it, but if I get a chance, or I don't know, we'll see. All right, so. What I did is the following. Actually, I probably won't review this again because we've spent too much time on this already. I have code in here to increment roles just like I had before. And if the rolls are equal to maximum rolls, then I disable the button, just like I did before. The difference, the thing that I interjected, is I'm storing the rolls also in a session variable. All right. What is a session variable? We'll talk about this more. But a session variable is a way to remember things throughout a person's browser session. All right. For example, if you go into Canvas to log on, you only have to log on once. You don't have to log on every page that you go to. All right? It remembers who you are as you navigate through the web application. More than likely, the information about who you are is stored in a session variable. So that will stay as long as your browser session is active and alive. Your session will expire if you go a certain period of time without communicating with the server. 
So in a nutshell, what I do is, the first time through, I initialize my variables, and I also store those variables in session variables. How do you declare a session variable? You simply say session, and in the square brackets, you give a name to your session variable. When I check to see if it's a post back, so each subsequent time, I don't initialize those variables again by creating new objects or setting rules <coughs> to zero. I pull the values out of the session variable. All right. So in effect, that remembers the values from last time. All right. So any of these variables I declare here, there's going to be new copies of them each time. Well, I want to restore their, old, their new values to what their old values were. So I store their old values in a session variable. And then if it's a post back, I restore those values. So that's why. And again, I'm assuming that first time was a fluke, so I'm not going to investigate this. I probably would be better off spending my time grading stuff. All right. So I click on button, it is disabled. The other thing we said we could do is disable these checkboxes, which I didn't do, but you could easily do. Yes? So the session variable expires after a time lapse. Is there like a certain time or like how long does it take, do you know? Okay, that's a good question. Uh, the question was, is I, I said that a session variable um, um, times out eventually. You can set that as a property on the web server or on the page. For example, the idea is that as long as the session is active, the server has to remember something about that session. And that takes up resources. And that's one of the drawbacks with session variables is storing a lot of objects in session variables usually isn't a good idea. But my objects are small, all right? So I'm not terribly concerned about that one, all right, that particular problem. But how long the session goes before it expires depends entirely on the problem that you're talking about. Let's say, for example, you're taking a quiz uh, in Angel, all right? It may be, uh, uh, well, you, you, you've taken a time machine to go back to spring semester and you're taking a quiz on Angel, or you are here in the present and you're taking a quiz on Canvas. All right. Let's say you're taking a quiz on Canvas. You log in. It remembers who you are. Let's say it's an essay question. You know, explain the purpose of session variables. And you're sitting there thinking and you, you, know, you think about what you're writing, you type it up, you revise it a few times, and then click Submit. If you make the session expire time too short, then it's going to forget who you are, and it's going to log you off effectively. On the other hand, if you keep a session active for a long period of time, then you run the risk of a couple things. Number one is it has to remember stuff about that session for a long time, and that's a resource drain on the server. The second problem is a security problem. Like, let's say you go to Gmail and log on and you leave your browser open, and if it never expired that session, it would always remember who you are, and someone could see your, your Gmail, all right, your, your email or whatever web-based email you used. So that's a problem sort of with that, that if you let it expire too long, um, if it's too long before it expires, you're chewing up resources on the server, and you run the risk of someone staying logged on, forgetting that the session is still active. If you expire too quick, you run the risk of cutting someone off in the middle of doing something. Um, and again, I've had that problem like with our campus web-based email. Like if I'm going to give like a thoughtful response or I'm writing a long response to the email, on occasion, by the time I've typed in the email I want to send and I click send, my session has expired, it forgot who I am, and I can't send the email. And that's very frustrating. All right. 
So you have to know, like, have an idea. And you can set this by page, you can set this, you can create a default for the web server, and all that. The other way that a session can end is you can explicitly log off. All right, if you click the button, for example, on Canvas that says log off, that immediately expires your session and it forgets everything about you. So that's the two ways. That's why a lot of times you'll see on websites, when you're done, please log off. Because they don't want their server to have to worry about those resources. So we'll revisit session variables later on, but I did want to sort of close the loop on this problem and show that that's one way to remember it. There's another way via the view state. There's another way, uh, I could have done this as an AJAX application, where I declared the variables and I updated the dice um, as part of an asynchronous request. That's sometimes known in, in ASP.NET as a partial postback. All right, where I'm not updating the entire page, but just part of the page. But I thought session variables would be the easiest way to address this, given that I really didn't want to spend too much time on this particular topic. Now, let's write, let, let, let's finish this up by doing one more thing. Let's write code that tells a user if they got a Yahtzee. A Yahtzee is five of, the, five of a kind. All right? So where am I going to put that code? So I'm not going to write a full-blown scoring application, right? Or a, a full-blown scoring class. But I want to score that much. I want to say, did I get a Yahtzee, yes or no? Where am I going to put that code? I'm going to make a game object, right? Because again, I don't want that in the UI. That's not a user interface issue. That's a business rule or problem domain rule. I don't want that in the dice object because a dice, a die object represents one dice. And it just does the things that dice do, like we did last time, rolling them, tell you what the, what the, the, what the value was, and so on. The rules, and dice can be used in a number of different games. And there's different rules depending on the game that you're playing. So I'm going to create a Yahtzee game object. And it's going to have a single method, is Yahtzee. What am I going to give to that method? Pardon me? Okay. So what are the arguments to that method going to be? Okay, that'll that'll be the code. It'll look to see if each it'll see if each dice has the same value. But what argument? What does this function need to do its job? The value of the dice. The value of the dice or the dice object itself. I'm going to give it the dice object itself. Alright? Not to split hairs, but I think that's a better way to do it. What's it going to return? A boolean. A boolean. True, they have Yahtzee. False, they do not. So let's go and let's complete that, sort of to close the loop on this one. So I'm going to go here and file, new, file. I'm going to create a class. I'm going to call it five dice game at the advice of my legal team. <laughs> Dr. Thunder, yeah. I, I love all the generic Dr. Pepper clones. Alright. Alright, I'm gonna put I don't need a constructor. So we'll get rid of that. I'm going to go in and say I'm not sure why I did that. Is it illegal to start a class name with a number, I wonder? Take two. 
I don't like that. I'm bailing. I'm going to call it five with spelling out the word. New file class. So I'm going to make a public boolean, public bool, is five of a kind. And it's going to accept as an argument five dice. All right. I'm going to make my five arguments be five die objects. This looks like the most violent function ever. Die arg1, die arg2, die arg3. Again, it's going to be easier to code this if I assume they don't have five of a kind and I test for the condition to see if they do have five of a kind. So I'm going to say B result equals false return B result. Now here's the thing that we talked about before about doing the code a bit a bit at a time. I could test this code. I could put in my UI now the label that says if they have Yahtzee or not and just have a hard coded to false that they don't. Just to test to make sure that the connection between the objects was working. All right. Or and then I could change it to say true and test that and make sure that that's working. All right. So you don't have to write the whole function. In fact, I'm going to do that. I'm going to go and create a label on my UI. Create one of these objects. I could call my method and give up my five dice. And if it returns a true, I can set the label to five of a kind. If it returns a false, I can set the label to say not five of a kind.
So you know I'm not done with this method, right? I'm assuming, you know, taking a pessimistic view, saying, no, nope, you don't have five of a kind, all right? I can test it, and I can test to this point. Again, the idea of doing something incrementally. Back in the old days, we called this a stub function. A stub function being a function that, like, has the same signature as the final version is going to be, but doesn't really do the work. It does maybe some of the work, all right? I could change it, too, to, um, you know, depending on how much of a, this I wanted to take on uh, at a time, I could change it just to look to see if the first two, to, two dice had the same value. And if they did, then assume all of them did, all right? Now, remember, this isn't what you're going to turn it in. This isn't the final version. But this is a way of you developing this incrementally as opposed to trying to do everything all at once. So I go and run this. I roll my three times. That's weird. I roll my three times. It tells me not five of a kind. I could then change the stub function to always return true. Run it. I might be willing to give extra credit if someone can figure out why it blows up the first time I've run it. communicating together works, all right? And that's not a trivial thing in a lot of cases. Remember, when you're building components, each component's doing one small, simple task, all right? So you have those things to worry about, but just as important is you have the way that the components are going to communicate with each other, and that is really important as well. So if you get that down, that's a major victory, all right? Now we just have to go and fill in the details of this and, and make sure that it's right. So, I'm going to go in and I'm actually going to write that function. And the function is going to look something like this. If arg1.getValue equals arg2getValue and I spelled get wrong. And the two ampersands represent an and condition. For an and condition to be true, all the parts of the condition have to be true. to test if the first argument equals the second argument, the value of the first dice equals the value of the second dice, probably better put, the value of the first equals the value of the third, the value of the fourth, first equals the value of the fourth, and finally the value of the first equals the value of the fifth. If all of those are true, then all the dice have the same value. And I can say that 
yes, they want. All right. Now, I'm going to run this. And this time the function should actually work after we get our customary error. And we didn't get it. I don't know. So I roll it. It's going to be very hard to test because I have to get Yahtzee for this to work. So what am I going to do? I'm going to not get Yahtzee a few times. I'm going to claim victory because it's going to say it, I didn't get Yahtzee. And then I'll leave it for you to test completely. Now, if you had to test this, though, what would you do? Yeah, you might go in and put little cheat code in. All right. Yeah, that that would that would force the dice to be all the same, or you might temporarily remove the restriction on how many rolls you get. All right, and not disable it and all that. But testing things that are unusual circumstances um, requires a little bit of creativity. You know, we had to. Uh, um, you know, I wrote applications that involved the database connection. Well, we wanted to write error code that handles what happens if the database is down. Well, what are we going to do? Take an axe to the server so that we can test what happens when the database goes down? No, you have to figure out a way to simulate or to fake that. Maybe put in the wrong name for the server in your code. So it can't find, if the server is supposed to be ABC, you put in ABCD. Well, it can't find that. That's pretty much the same thing as the server being down and you can test your, your code. So testing these sort of unusual circumstances can be a little bit of a challenge. All right. Oh, we got three twos. Okay. I want to uncheck those, right? I forgot what you want to uncheck the ones you want. No, I want to I uncheck the ones I want to keep. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm not sure. Okay, there. And there. Not by the kind. All right. What I'm going to do is this. My cheat is going to be to remove the limitation of three clicks. So, I am, I'm going to evaluate to see if I have Yahtzee every time, but I'm not going to disable the button. That way I can roll 10 times if I want to. And I hope I'll be able to get a Yahtzee that way. First roll. First. Yeah, right. That would, that would be wild. All right. So I roll. functionality for that so it's still checking so it uh, what was what what did you say no I, I am checking each time I think well what can I do I could debug that And let's see. All right. All right. It's checking. value of 2, 1, 
one, six, and one. First of all, is that correct? Where did the browser go? Two, one, five, one. That's interesting, and I'll tell you why. It may simply have not refreshed the screen. I'm going to let this function finish, oh, and then, yeah. then I'm going to go and see if it changes it to a 6. And I'm going to go continue. And that's what, I, that's what seems to have happened, is that the old image was still there for a second. So I'm going to roll again. Roll again. Interesting. What do you see happening? Or put differently, what do you see not happening? It's not going to your breakpoint. It's not going to my breakpoint. And why not? It's exactly what someone said, I think, but I ignored. <laughs> right? Which goes to show, if you don't know what's wrong, don't be so quick to dismiss when someone else makes a suggestion. What does this code say? I can tell you exactly the line. I'm going to play the great Karnak. I say, what, which, which I realize probably only a handful of people remember Johnny Carson and the great Karnak. But um, anyhow, I digress. The code says if roles is equal to max roles. All right? So it's only checking it on time number three. So it probably works. Ah, make it greater than or equal to for my little rigged test here. And then I can get, I'm so confident this works, I'm going to get rid of the breakpoint. Which, again, what do they say? Good morning. Oh. September is National Preparedness Month. Jesus. As part of the Lorain County Community College uh, Campus Security Department is testing our on campus public address system. This is only a test. September is National Preparedness Month. As part of that Lorain County Community College Campus Security Department is testing our on campus public address system. This is only a test. Thank yeah, you. Have a good day. Well, it's like, I was this far from like flipping the desk, <laughs> you know. I was like, whoa, this is high school. Wow. Um, okay, well, um, that was interesting. <laughs> I know they have one. That was probably a test. That, that might have turned into a test to see if any of you folks knew CPR, you know. Uh, <laughs> All right. At any rate, let's let's try this again. I, for a second, I thought maybe the voice was going to say, "Maybe you should leave the break point in," <laughs> you know, but it didn't. All right. So let's run it. <laughs> well, you know, you know, inspiration sometimes comes from strange places. So we'll roll this, and I have two threes, so I will. Uncheck those. shots at anything and I'll get it right eventually. All right. Now, there's one tiny, subtle little thing that I'm going to change about this before we move on. All right. And I don't expect you to necessarily know it, but does anyone have a guess? Maybe. 
Max Rolls. All right. Where does Max Rolls live right now? Pardon me? In the UI. He lives in the UI. Should Max Rolls live in the UI? No. No. Why not? It's part of the rules. It's part of the rules of the game. Right. So Max Because think about it. Let's say you're making a version of this for kids, right? Maybe a, 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 an easier version. You don't want to discourage the little little fellows, so you make it easier for them. How would you make it easier for them? Give them more rolls, right? So maybe an easy version of the game, you get five rolls. Maybe a average version of the game, you get three rolls. Maybe you know, and so on. Maybe a real tough version, you get two rolls or something like that. That's a rule of the game, and it lives in the UI. All right. So we could create something like. We could create an argument where you would instantiate that rules object right at the beginning with the number of role, or with the, with the level of difficulty that maybe you get from a slider control or a drop down or whatever. All right? And then we could ask the object, the game's object, gee, do they have any more roles left? And it would just answer yes or no. All right? We're not going to go quite that far. We're not going to add the level of difficulty, but it's important for you to understand why I'm saying that that's a rule of the game and not part of the UI. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create what's called a constant. All right? What is a constant? Never constant never changes. And this sounds silly, but a constant is like a variable that never changes, right? Well, how is it a variable then? Well, it's not a variable. It's a constant. How do you declare a constant in C-sharp? You, did wait, let, let's back up. Did you did you say you just do it? You just do it. Okay. <laughs> let's Google it to see what. And I and I and I believe you're right. You say C O N S T, and then you give a name. Exactly. You just do it. In other words. Right. You have to give the type. That's true. And I'm going to do one other thing. Yes, a level one spell, copy and paste. And I'm going to put it in here. First of all, I'm going to make it all capital, the name. Why am I doing that? Yeah, to make it stand out, and so it's obvious looking at the code that it is a constant. That's by no means required. That's just my convention. All right? I'm going to say static right now. All right? What does static mean? Right. That means that it's a constant. It's true for all members of this. It doesn't depend on which Yahtzee game we're talking about. Right. Whether I got five of a kind or not depends on which Yahtzee game I'm talking about. Right. Depends what the five dice are rolled or whatever. All right. However, how many rolls you have, forgetting the fact that we could add a level of difficulty in, that is three for everything. It would be like for example, if we made a circle object, if we made a circle object, what is one constant that exists when you're dealing with circle objects? Pi, right? Each circle doesn't have a different value of pi. I therefore could declare that as a constant, and it's related to circles, but it doesn't vary depending on the circle you're talking about. All right. I'm making this public. Typically, I've said in the past to make attributes private. Why am I making this one public? So I can access it from other classes, and my concern about being able to change it doesn't exist because it's a constant anyhow. So I couldn't go in and mess it up and give it a value. All right. So this is one case where we can be 
we can let it slide a little bit and say, okay, this guy, just to make it easy, we'll, we'll make it um, public. So then in, in my UI, I can go in here and say, instead of if roles equals max roles, I can say if roles equal five dice game dot max rolls. And then I can get rid of that from here. And we should still be Can't be marked static. Why not? Scrape it on the declaration. Oh, wait a minute. The variable's constant is uh, okay. So it's already. Started. It's already by virtue of being. By virtue of being defined a constant, it's by definition static. Okay, that makes sense. I was ready to fight someone there. <laughs> it was like, don't tell me I can't make this guy static. And of course we get that error. And it's funny, people, people were talking a little bit after class about the one thing they like about my lectures is the fact that I develop something as opposed to simply presenting something that's finished. And little things like this is exactly why you prepare things in advance, right? Because how many little mistakes have I made today that have been problematic? Well, a few of them, right? And had it been prepared in time. So you take the good with the bad, you know? Uh, I will say, um, you know, the more comfortable I am with something, the more willing I am to just wing it like this. Like, I'm pretty comfortable writing this code. Yeah, I run into some snafus and all that, but stuff that I haven't worked on as long, I try to come in with stuff prepared. So, but again, that's sort of the downside of this. Still, even, even going through this also helps us to see that we all make mistakes. It looks like you just <laughs> try to fast, and then when we, well, when we do homework, right. we try to figure things out for hours, like, well, if it provides that lesson, then that's a valuable service. <laughs> that's not necessarily why I make those mistakes. Again, after I've been teaching for a few more years, I'm going to be able to 
tell my classes that's why I make those mistakes and be able to do it with a straight face. But the other thing I think it helps is troubleshooting. In other words, like what process do I go through to see like what's wrong? All right, I expected it to do this. It didn't. Well, where do I go from here? So now we're back on track with that. All right. Let me summarize shall we say the journey that we've taken that, that makes it sound overly dramatic but let's talk about all the different pieces that we have I talk a lot about developing things in components and there's, com there's all sorts of kinds of components that we can talk about, all right? And let me go through some of the components we've talked about so far. And when I say so far, I mean just in general web development too, not just in this class. All right, so here's a list of the kinds of components that we've used. We have our HTML, and this is wet. Oh, that is so gross. Yeah, it's wet. That's weird. I'm going to go in and die now. All right. I, I, I am going to race folks into the lab to grab the hand sanitizer, but. We have HTML, which in the case of .NET is actually our ASPX file, more or less, all right, that generates HTML. We have our ASPX, um, no, that's not what I meant. We have our AS, yeah, it is. The optimist in me says that they clean this room. And that's a cleaning product. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Let's clean the chalk eraser. The ASP.NET <laughs> controls are another component. <laughs> we have our CSS. We have our code behind file. And each one does its own role, right? Each one is something that we're piecing together to make an application that works, right? And one of the driving forces for us in this is consistency, is reusability, maintainability, other thing I forgot, we just talked about today, is the custom classes and separating the logic from the UI. All these things we've done, simply put, is to ensure consistency, maintainability, reusability, right? Why do we put our die in a custom class so we can reuse that? We can make a couple dice games, all right? And we already have a building block to build that on. All right. Why do we separate the code behind from the um, ASPX file? Well, again, that makes it more clear. One person can work on one while another person's working on the other. Why do we separate CSS from HTML? Well, so we can change the CSS and um, we can keep our website looking consistent, having a consistent look and feel just by changing the CSS. Why do we have ASP.NET controls? And same sort of thing, right? So that we can write a custom, we, we can write, um, uh, we can do validation on a form very simply without having to reinvent the wheel each time. Now, there's one thing, and all this is geared to being able to do the same thing on different pages without having to code it by hand each time, right? So we put, we create a CSS file so we don't have to put on every one of our pages embedded CSS. All right, we put it in one pile and file. We put it in a pile, in a file. <laughs> Dr. Seuss's lesson in programming. We put it in a file 
so that all the pages can use it. We put our custom class code in there so any page that needs a dice has access to it, and so on and so forth. Now, there's one area that we are very weak in, all right? And by we, I mean only with the with, only using these tools. There's one area that we still have to code custom every page with these tools that we've talked about so far. And that is to make our web pages have a consistent structure. All right? What in any of these tools would allow us to have a consistent structure? And what do I mean by a consistent structure? I mean maybe all our pages look like this. We have a header up here. We have navigation over here. We have our content area over here. And we have our footer over here. Now, yeah, we have CSS to achieve the physical appearance and the physical layout. But there's going to be certain chunks of HTML that are going to be common on every page. Right? We can't put those in CSS. All right? The header, for example, might be the same on every single page. The navigation. If you're talking about a small website, the navigation might be the same on every single page. The footer may be the same on every single page. The only area that might be different is the content area. On one page it's going to have one thing, on another page it's going to have another thing there. But three of the four blocks on this page are oftentimes going to be identical on every single page. And that's a good thing, right? We want our pages to look consistent. That's a design principle, right? We don't want people thinking they're going to different sites when they visit our different pages. All right? Now, CSS can take care of the layout of this, to put the header here, and to put the nav here, and to put the footer there. But the content of that, if you were doing this in CISS 216, the web development class, if you had five pages, you'd have to make those five pages by hand. All right? You'd have to cut and paste the header, nav, and footer, all right, on every single page. And if you later went on and said, I want to add our phone number to the header, you'd have to go back and add that piece of code to all five of your HTML pages. Well, again, do not repeat yourself. Anytime you hear about code that where you have to, to make one change, you have to change several places, that's a warning sign that you might be able to do it better. Now, we can do it better with the tools that we've been given so far, but we have another tool, and that is master pages. All right? There are a set of controls, and we'll review them, that you can use to sort of get around this problem, and the first of which we're going to explore. And you can think of these as sort of being components for your UI on a larger level, things like navigation and breadcrumbs and site maps and um, um, master pages. The idea of a master page is like this. It's very common for a website to have a certain layout and only a certain area of it varies from page to page. Let's pick a website. Someone have in mind a good website? Well-designed website. Loyal employees. Yeah. <laughs> but it is a, it is a really it is a, damn it is a, it is a good example. In fact, if no one if no one thought of a better one, I was going to use that one anyhow. So we'll go and we'll look at this. All right. Here's what I want you to notice. Let's go. This is our home page. Has a little slideshow. All right. What I want you to notice is this navigation on the top. That is going to be the same on every page.
As we click around, that is the same on every single page. That's good, right? It's consistent. You don't have to go look around for the navigations. You know, could you imagine a website where um, it wasn't in the same place on every page? Well, that'd be kind of confusing. Now, a little bit of variance is okay. Like maybe your home page has a navigation in one place and your other pages have it somewhere else. That's kind of not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about, um, well, for one thing, it's possible to have literally every page have that or every main page. And secondly, you know, you do want some level of consistency. Consistency doesn't mean every page needs to be structured identically, but instead be similar. All right, here's a page that's a little bit different. Well, actually not. It was different for a second, but then, then finally support. Is that what you do? Yeah. I was going to say, this has a link to, to your email address, right? You click on it and, you know, you, in fact, if I said, like, click support here, your phone would probably go off, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Notice also on the bottom, there's a footer that's consistent on every page. Now, you could imagine, all right, and let's just pick one of these pages, Apple Consultants Network, all right? Top is still the same, bottom is still the same, and so on. Let's assume that these are all the pages that they have. And they probably even have more than that if you get like embedded deeper. But let me just assume that you have these pages. It looks to me like there is in the neighborhood of say 50 pages there. All right. So. Steve Jobs invents a new Apple Watch, and you have to put it on the navigation. That's 50 places you have to go in and add the link for that. Well, that doesn't sound like a good idea to me, right? That's repeating yourself. What happens when you repeat yourself? You get it wrong sometimes, all right? You copy and Even if it's a copy and paste, you get that wrong sometimes, all right? Or you forget one or whatever, and you have inconsistency, which is a chink in the armor of well-designedness, all right? So what we want to do is we want to follow the lead of those other tools that we had, and we want to put things that are in common in one place, and one place only, and then use that one place every time we want to make a new page. And the stuff that's going to be common on a bunch of pages is called what is on the master page. So with the master page, you create and you put on the page the common stuff that's going to be on every page. You then clone the master page for every new page that you create, and your new page will be comprised of the stuff that's in the master page plus the new stuff that is just on the new page. So let's go and do that. And let's create a brand new web application. I did not want to do that. Let me get rid of that one. So I'm going to go and create a brand new application. So I'll go here, file, new, website. Visual C Sharp, ASP.NET empty website. I'll browse and put it here. And put it on the desktop. And I'm going to make a website about rabbits. So, click open, ask me if I want to create it. Yes, I do. What do I want? And again, we have a number of choices here. And for now, we might look at the web form site later on, but for now, we are going to use simply creating an empty website because we're doing everything ourselves. 
So I'm going to click that. And I'm going to click OK. And I get my folder just like I did the first week of the class. I'm going to go up here and say File, New, File. But I'm going to pick going to be the same on every single page. Now I want to just finish this and sort of go over a complete example of a master page and then we'll definitely build on this next time. So I'm going to go and I'm going to create my first master page and when I go in here I get what looks like pretty standard ASP.NET page with the exception of this. Oops. There's two content placeholders. The content placeholder is where when I clone this master page the specific content for each specific page is going to appear. And there's a section for this in the header, in case you want to put something custom in the header of a page. And there's a section of this in the, in, uh, in the body. And you could add more if you wanted to. All right. This corresponds to what I drew on the board as being the content area of each page. Or on Apple's website, this corresponds to... this area here that's different on each page. So I'm going to put this kind of thing in the master page because it's on every single page. I'm going to put this kind of thing on the master page because it's on every single page. This kind of stuff is represented in the master page by the content placeholder because that's what's going to be different on each page. So to start out, I'm going to put, I'm going to keep it simple, right? And I'm going to go and I'm just going to put a header section. And I'm going to put an H1, my page about rabbits. All right. Then I'm going to put a footer on the bottom of the page all right and that's <coughs> basic HTML and we could do anything on this master page that we could do on any HTML document all right now I can't run this though because this isn't a web page. This is like a template for a web page. In order for me to use this, I'm going to have to create a new web page, a web form, an ASPX page. So I'll go here and say File, New, File, Pick, pick Web Form, Default.ASPX, and I'm going to check Select Master Page. What Select Master Page will be will be I can pick which of the master pages I want to clone. You actually can have several master pages, right? For example, on some larger websites, every page might not be identical, but pages within a section might be identical. All right? There could be a master page for each section of the site then. You can even nest master pages. In other words, maybe every page on the site has a certain set of content, and then you have sections where every page within that section has some more content, and so on down the line. But for now, we're just going to use one master page, and I'm going to clone it and make a web form. And I only have one master page, so it's obvious which one I want. 
Notice now in the default.aspx, I do not get a complete web page. I get those two content placeholders. All right, I actually get ASP content tags, which point to the placeholders in the master page. And that's where I put in the specific content. Notice that well, besides my terrible typing here that use one starting tag and a different ending tag. Even when I get that correct, I get the squiggly blue line. All right? What's that telling me? That looks like a valid paragraph tag. It is, but it's outside the content areas. And it's outside the content placeholders. That's the only place where I can place stuff on each specific page, is in a place that corresponds to a placeholder in the master page. So, I have these two areas, one in the body and one in the head section to work with on each individual page. Now if I need more, I can put more placeholders in. For example, if I wanted to have a, you know, a, a uh, sub-navigation that was in a different spot or whatever, I could put another placeholder in. So now when I run this, all right, it's going to display the default ASPX page, and the code from that is coming from two places. The shell of it is going to come from the default page, and the specifics of those content placeholders is going to come from the page itself. So I run this, and I get... This section and this section, whoops, which came from my master page, and then the middle section, which comes from my page itself. So, we can very easily go and take this and create a shell for our site and clone as many pages as we want. Uh, clone's probably not the right word. Um, associate those pages with the master page. And now, if I have another thing that I want to put on the header, I only have to make the change in the master page, and that change will be reflected everywhere. I don't have to go into my 50 different HTML page and make that. So the master page is a place for you to put common HTML content. And just like by separating CSS into its own file, I can change the content of all my pages simply by changing the master page, and then every page which uses that master page gets the change. All right? So we'll build on this in coming examples, where we'll go and we'll make something that actually looks like a completed web page instead of just this sort of concept. Any questions? All right, I will post both these examples up, and we'll continue on this on Thursday.